Coming up this week on Montclair News Lab. It's our biggest episode yet, a half hour special to close off 2018. From 50 years of coaching young athletes. It's just great fun, it makes me younger. To overcoming sickness. We are up to the point that 11 hours out of the day he is not on any machinery. An intimate conversation with a TV news star. Is that we have a free press, that people have the right to and believe that they can get accurate information. To everyday heroes. Through this week, we want to show that we're a Montclair State family. We scour campus, Montclair, and New Jersey to bring you the stories you won't forget. Hello, and welcome to this year's final episode of Montclair News Lab. From the School of Communication and Media, I'm Amanda Eustace. And I'm Ashley Kuzikonki. Today, we start our show by looking at something that is important to many students building a career. For anyone, building a career is a challenge. For Byron Pitts, co-anchor of ABC's Nightline, it came with extra hardships. Pitts grew up struggling to read and even speak. I had the opportunity to meet with him and learn how he overcame these issues to become one of America's leading journalists. My mama said that God doesn't put stumbling blocks in your life, you put stepping stones. Byron Pitts is the co-anchor of ABC News Nightline. He recently visited Montclair State University to receive the Alan B. Dumont Broadcaster of the Year Award at the School of Communication and Media. <laughs> Pitts landed his first on-air reporting job in Greensville, North Carolina. He made $8,600 a year. 30 years later, he's made a name for himself, but it wasn't easy. I sat down with Pitts to hear how he overcame every obstacle that was put in his path. When you were younger, you had a very hard time reading and writing. Now, what was that like? I mean, as someone who didn't learn to read until I was 12, really closer to 13, and stuttered until my junior year in college, what that meant was for much of my childhood, I was voiceless, right? Um, wasn't that bright, uh, couldn't speak clearly. And what do we do as journalists? Our job is to give voice to the voiceless. Pitts went on to college, but then decided to drop out. A professor talked him out of it. You met somebody who kind of changed, changed your route and made you stick with it. Absolutely right. Tell me about that. Her name is Ula Luz. She encouraged me and she showed me the techniques I needed to develop, the skills I needed to develop to be a better student. Pitts graduated from Ohio Wesleyan University with a journalism and speech communication degree. Overcoming all of these obstacles, what advice can you give to students that want to transition and go into the business right out of college? There's nothing that beats hard work, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the people who I know who are most successful uh, in our business are people who just work hard. I wouldn't even put talent in the top 10 things, qualifications to be successful in broadcast journalism. It's nice, but it ain't, doesn't make my top 10. So having my generation now going into this business, mm -hmm. President Trump's always attacking journalists and different media outlets. How should we be prepared for this? Look, this isn't the first time that people in power have criticized the media. And I think criticism is good. Like, I, I think, you know, we should be called into check when we do things wrong, fine. But this notion of demonizing journalism, demonizing institutions that are fundamental to our nation, I think is dangerous. Awful things happen in the dark in any society. And so that's a lesson to us that sure, journalists need to be held accountable, sure it needs to be done right and properly, but part of what makes America a great nation, and we are a great nation, is that we have a free press, that people have the right to and believe that they can get accurate information. And so whether it's me or your generation, the generations to come, that's our job. So let those people criticize us and, and you know, let the chips fall, fall where they may. But it's not, not the first time won't be the last. Pitt's words resonate with students. When you have someone in your life who won't give up on you, uh, you learn not to give up on yourself. He not only shared pieces of advice for us as students that are trying to get involved in the industry, but also some of his own experiences. So it gives us kind of a look into what our future may consist of. I feel as if it's, it really does pay forward if you follow what you want and do what you have to do to get there. Nothing can really hold you back is how you, how you go about the obstacles. I'll be the first in my family to graduate. So he mentioned something in the beginning about how it is both a blessing and a burden, and I felt that completely. Pitts believes that our generation is what the news industry needs. Fresh needs fresh blood. Like, we need you, we need your generation. 
Byron Pitts could not be more down to earth. He spent an hour after the award ceremony meeting individually with students. Now we'll look at a man whose career is in his rear view mirror. Donnie Rubinoff is retiring after 50 years of coaching football at Montclair State University. Bryn McDonald has a remarkable story. In 1968, Lyndon B. Johnson was in office. The average price of gas was 34 cents and Montclair State University was still called Montclair State College. This was the Montclair State football team that year when Don Rubinoff began coaching. Coach Don says it has been exciting and delightful. Everybody has always been absolutely wonderful to me as a coach, as a person. It's just been fun. I mean, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Donnie is a true character. He is someone that no one really will ever forget once they've met Donnie. He leaves a great impression on people. Rubinoff began his coaching career in Livingston after graduating from the University of California, Berkeley. Rubinoff transitioned from high school to college football when he became a staple on the sidelines at Montclair State. Just the quality of kids that we have is absolutely amazing. I figured out I've coached 515 games in 50 years. I just can't walk away. Donnie really adds a great sense of levity and a great positive energy. When Donnie walks into the room, everybody takes note. He comes in with always a smile on his face, always something happy, and to have a place that has become an unofficial home of his is great. It means a lot to him. In Donnie's first year at Montclair, the football team had a record of two and seven. 50 years later, the team went eight and two, one of the most successful seasons in years. Being with the kids on the field, on the sidelines, during preseason, it's just great fun. It makes me younger. Um, he truly has a great passion for the school and for, for all things Montclair State. 50 years, and the feeling on the field with the kids and the coaching staff was excellent. I mean, they were there for one reason, to play football for Montclair State. But it has been, it has been a great experience for me. I've enjoyed every minute of it. I wish I was 50 years younger, I'd do it again. <laughs> Much has changed throughout the past five decades, but Donnie Rubinoff has remained a constant in the locker room and on the field. For Montclair News Lab, this is Bryn McDonald. We just saw two stories on making it in your career. For those just starting their career, it can seem like a frightening prospect. To help us sort through what it takes, we've invited the new Career Services Director from the College of the Arts here at Montclair State, Victoria Nada. Hello, thank you for coming. Hi, thanks for having me. So how did you land your first job? Well, it was a long time ago um, in an age when the internet actually didn't exist. So what I had to do was kind of scour the newspapers um, and see what available jobs were out there. I actually found my first job through my uncle, so it was a bit of networking. Um, he worked at a place called DeVry College of Technology, and there was an opening in their career services department, and he said, I think you might be a good fit. This is something you might enjoy. And since I really didn't want to leave college at the time, I thought, hey, why not? So I put my application in, I somehow landed an interview, and I found myself in my first job in career services. Now, we have all these online resources, Indeed.com, Monster.com, to help us find jobs, but in such a digital uh, heavy age error. Where should we look for jobs or how should we sort through all of them? So the great thing for you guys here at Montclair is that we have an online job portal called Hire Red Hawk, which ha houses all types of jobs and internships uh, for current students here. Everything has been vetted. These are employers that have called this college specifically so that they could post jobs and opportunities. A lot of them are actually alumni who have come back to post jobs because they want to hire some of their fellow Red Hawks. So Hire Red Hawk is a great place to start. You mentioned Indeed and another great site would be LinkedIn. That's a great place for you to network with professionals in your industries and connect with other individuals who are seeking jobs too. What can you say are one of or a couple of the biggest mistakes that students have while looking for jobs? Oh, probably the first one is just waiting too long to look for, for an opportunity. So folks who are getting ready to graduate in May would probably want to start looking now to try and find a, a full-time opportunity because sometimes the job search can take six months to a year uh, to find an opportunity or something that 
that you're going to enjoy. So waiting too long is, is probably the biggest thing. And then not putting enough effort into the job search. So it's almost like a full-time job looking for a job. You want to spend a quality amount of time searching the internet, putting your application in, revising your resume, and sending it out to employers. I think the third thing is not tailoring resumes and applications to the job that you're applying for. The worst thing you can do is send an application in with a general objective or a general statement. You want to make sure you've taken the time to review the job description and apply directly to that position with the skills and interests that are listed. Now I know every job is different, but what are just the general and basic soft skills that any person looking to hire somebody are looking for? So in this day and age, uh, communication, both written and verbal, is kind of kind of key. So that's something that a lot of people are not always comfortable with, um, and it just takes a little bit of practice. So being able to communicate um, verbally and in writing is, is super important. Um, I, being personable, um, having great interpersonal skills, and being able to connect with somebody. Do you have any advice for students that you know are soon graduating, or any advice for all anybody looking for a job? Um, networking. Networking is absolutely key. So networking early and networking quite a bit. So that means attending career fairs, going to job events, mm -hmm. meeting people in the industry, collecting business cards, making sure that you keep in touch with all those individuals because those are the people that are most likely going to be able to help you land your first position. You want to keep in touch with them, you want to connect with them on LinkedIn, and you want to grow that network so you know that there are going to be people out there to help you. Thank you for all of the interesting advice, especially looking to now go into the real world. Finding a career isn't the only thing that takes hard work. Sometimes getting to campus can be a challenge. News Lab reporter Therese Sheridan rides along with a student whose commute comes with its own struggles. It's a Tuesday morning at the Booton train station, and student Bobby Ezzi is waiting for his 910 train to Montclair State University. It's only a 28 minute ride, but this 9:10 a.m. train is the last train as it can take to get to his class at 1 p.m. It kind of varies each day. Like if I have, let's say, a 10 o'clock class, which is like my Monday and Thursday, I normally take the 749 train. Wednesday, Friday, normally the 710 train. Today, like a day like this, since I only have one class, at one, I normally take the 910 train. Montclair State University is home to two different train stations, Montclair Heights and Montclair State University. Yet, not many people are aware of the commuters who use them. When we talk about commuters, we think of parking on campus, and we think of like how many people have to park so far away on campus, but we don't really talk about the students that take other forms of transportation. Despite the large gaps of time in this less popular commute, as he enjoys the train and even sees the extra time as beneficial. I can do work on the train, like on the ride up and ride home, like do my work, sleep, get some rest, and also like depending on the flexibility of your schedule, you're able before your train leaves, get some work done. This isn't the only benefit as he sees. Although you would rather commute by car, you're saving more money, like you don't have to pay for gas, as well as you don't have to pay for tuition, like room and board. In the beginning, I used to pay about $11 for the, a ticket. And thanks to a partnership between NJ Transit and Montclair State, full-time students can get a 25% discount on monthly rail passes through a program called Quick Tick. Then near the end of September, we purchased a student pass, which is about $128 a month. It's definitely worth the experience. So although taking the train takes time, it can be well worth the wait. For Montclair News Lab, I'm Teresa Sheridan. Not everyone is as positive as Bobby. We asked Montclair State students to tell us about their worst commutes. So every day is a bit of a nightmare uh, commuting. I have to drive an hour from Augusta to Montclair. A hard commute story was first semester freshman year. It took me, I live 10 minutes away, I live in Lyndhurst, and it took me three and a half hours to get to campus due to an accident on 46, and then it took me another, an hour and a half to get off the of campus. But one day in particular sticks out that was kind of a nightmare was, uh, it was snowing that day, and I happened to see two cars spin out and crash into each other. 
That's the one of the worst things here at Montclair, especially on Mondays. I feel like I can never find parking. I come a little later due to work, but it's always such a hassle and people are honking and fighting over parking spots. It's like a nightmare. Um, one of the other guys got out of his car, ran to the other car, other people were calling police. I was late to class, so I figured I just had to drive by and get out of there as quickly as possible. Uh, so about two weeks ago during the snowstorm, uh, the shuttles got shut down, so trying to get back to the transit lot just was like not gonna happen. And what ended up happening is I stayed here and slept under the pool table for like the whole night and with the lights off that just, or lights on the whole night, that just really wasn't going well. Tweet us your commuter horror stories at MSU News Lab. Every week, we check in with the latest from our campus newspaper, The Montclarian. Here's what they've been up to this week. This week in news, we talked about the mysterious layoff of a modern languages professor at Montclair State and how it left students devastated and wondering why she was laid off. This week in the sports section, we have a student player profile. He's a freshman track star. His name is Spencer Patton, and he's got a pretty interesting story to tell with his academics and how he balances that with, with his game. So. This week in our entertainment section, we have an article about the poet Martina Evans, who visited an art of poetry class and talked about poems in a book she published. A new issue of The Montclarian is published every Thursday. Grab your own copy or visit the website at montclarian.org. It's time now to meet a group of Montclair State students who came together over peanut butter and jelly for a good cause. Nikki Vadas has a sweet story. It's called our Pack to Give Back. Montclair State students packaging food, hygiene kits, blankets, and more for Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week during the Thanksgiving holiday. Ruth Delgado is the volunteer coordinator at MSU's Center for Student Involvement. Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week is a national week in where universities, colleges, communities, organizations raise awareness for both these issues of hunger, food insecurity, and homelessness or displacement. Our Pack to Give Back was a huge success. We were able to make more than 450 hygiene and snack kits in under 21 minutes which shows the impact of how much our students are dedicated to giving back to their community. A lot of our students are coming out to these events and it just shows the impact of how educating our students can further enhance the way that we can give back to our community as well as within our own home here at Montclair State. Angelie Francisco is a senior and volunteer for the Hunger and Homelessness Awareness event team. I feel like just coming here and making sandwiches can make even a small impact. All the events at the end of the day will help a lot of people out there. I came out today because it means a lot to me to help the community and others that may not be able to help themselves. So I hope that a sandwich that I made today makes someone smile and makes someone stay. A lot of our students face these issues and they may feel that nobody understands what they're going through, that they sometimes feel like a statistic. And through this week, we want to show that we're a Montclair State family. For Montclair News Lab, I'm Nikki Vadis. Good health. It's something people take for granted, but not for the family you're about to meet. Olivia Paez reports on a child's rare disorder and how he and his family are fighting back. Two years ago, Josiah Morales was born with an extremely rare disorder. Pullen Mobius syndrome is a complex congenital dis neurological disorder that affects one out of 500,000 individuals. This condition prevents all facial movements, such as smiling, frowning, puckering lips for a kiss. This condition also affects his chest muscles, so his right muscle is underdeveloped, which affects his entire limb on the same side. Last year, Josiah needed a ventilator in order to breathe, but recently, Josiah's mother has noticed how his health has improved. Josiah's dependence on machinery, on the medical machinery, has finally begun to reduce, which is fantastic. We are up to the point that 11 hours out of the day, he is not on any machinery. Along with his health improvements, Josiah is also learning how to communicate with his family. He has just been absorbing sign languages left and right. He knows his colors, he knows his numbers, he knows animal sounds. And the most beautiful part is that him and his sister, they communicate that way. So it's really been a great way to actually finally communicate with him in that way. 
It's been really great to see how his communication has improved. I mean, from a sense of understanding what he needs and what he wants, I feel like I can bond more with him. A child of his age usually combines one to two signs, maybe three, but Josiah is able to combine four to five signs, enabling him to have a conversation. Um, it only takes one time to show him how to make a specific sign. He will learn it and demonstrate it right back. The combination of his parents' resilience and by his own merit, he has taken leaps and bounds with his communication skills. From where we were before, where we are now, it's not drastic, but it's definitely positive. Like we're moving in a direction that's better for him and for us as a family. One child's positive improvement leaves a lasting mark on a close-knit family. From Montclair News Lab, this is Olivia Payas. What a heartwarming story. Every week, our friends at WMSC gives us a look at what's coming up at our campus radio station. This week, our secret camera caught up with Pat and Christian when they least expected it. Come on, guys. Let's see what they're doing. Man, I don't know. No, I, I, I mean, I don't know about no, this. So, w wait, what's the problem now? The, everybody thought the sweater was mine? Wait, the sweater wasn't yours? No. I don't even like Christmas that much. It fits you Mary's. so well. <sighs> That's because I work women's clothes. Okay, okay. Obviously. Christian, Christian, it's for the kids. You're right. It's for the kids. It's for the kids. It's, it's for, for the kids. kids. What? Not, Mary, not Mary, now. Come on! Not now. Hi, I'm Pat Chichetti. Hi, I'm Pat Chichetti. Mm. And I'm a Christmas elf. And it's almost Christmas here at 94.3 WMSC. We are so excited for the holiday season and we want to do something to give back. We're doing a toy drive right here in the studio. That's right, if you want to help out, you can bring a nice, approximately $15 gender non-specific toy to help out a local third grader. Just drop it off right at our office and we promise not to play with it. <laughs> and make sure you tune in to 90.3 WMSC anywhere in the world on WMSCRadio.com or the iHeartRadio app. Or if you're on campus, tune in to 90.3 on your FM radio dial. Happy holidays from all of us to you. And Christian, I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas too, bud. <sighs> and a happy holidays to all of you back at home. Till the new year. Happy holidays to you too, guys. Make sure you tune in to WMSCRadio.com, the iHeartRadio app, and 90.3 on FM radio. The recent death of President George H.W. Bush reminded us once again of the contributions made by those members of what's called the greatest generation. A recent event at the Yogi Berra Museum on the campus of Montclair State honored another World War II vet and veterans from all eras, as Altine Wells reports. Yogi Berra was a star baseball player known for his quirky sayings, but he was also a World War II veteran who served in a Navy ship during D-Day. The museum honors him and other vets by holding an annual Veterans Resources Fair. Lindsay Berra is Yogi's granddaughter and a board member of the museum. She says a fair like this is important because many vets don't know about the services available to them. So they can walk through the museum and talk to all these people and learn about health care and you know, all the advice that they can get and programs that the government offers for free. And it's just a great thing for them to be able to take advantage of. Jim Seary is also a board member and has veterans in his family. It's um, important, I think, to get to know veterans um, face to face, not just on the news and it's such a small percentage of the population now that we just don't get the opportunity to interact with more recent veterans um, on a day-to-day -day basis. This year's Veterans Fair featured a new addition. It's called the New Jersey Distinguished Service Medal and it was presented to World War II veteran Gerard Sorrell. He has accomplished so much in his life including serving his country so well and uh, it was an honor and a privilege to host that ceremony for us today at the museum. It is a distinct and fitting honor for the museum built in Yogi Berra's name to host the presentation of the New Jersey Distinguished Service Medal to Gerard Sorrell. Like Yogi, Jerry Sorrell served our country during World War II. And like Yogi, Jerry Sorrell is an exemplary member of what will always be known as the greatest generation. The governor of the state of New Jersey, Philip D. Murphy, under the authority of 38A, colon 15-2, the New Jersey Revised Statutes, awards the Distinguished Service Medal to PFC Gerard Sorrell for distinguished service in the U.S. Army 
or in the Second World War in the European, African, and Middle Eastern theaters of operation. Signed, Governor Philip D. Murphy. The Veterans Resources Fair provided a great service to those who served by informing and connecting people. Our goals for this event for the future are just to keep getting more and more resource providers in here and to keep um, awareness going so people know that we have the event so we can get more and more veterans in here every year and help them um, have access to these great programs that are available to them. For Montclair News Lab, this is Altenay Wells. They call it sex toy bingo, a frivolous name for an important subject, safe and responsible sex. Recently, students at Montclair State got together to win prizes and learn a couple of things. Robert O'Connor has our story. Oh, as in open relationship 61. Oh. This is not your average game of bingo. The student center ballroom, packed with over 400 Red Hawks competing at bingo for among other prizes, sex toys. We know that in college, people are exploring, they're experimenting, they're figuring things out, and so we do sex toy bingo to try to teach people. The third annual sex toy bingo kicked off with a discussion about condom use, self-pleasure, and other safe sex practices. But we also like to make sure that it's a sex positive experience where they feel like they're empowered to ask important questions about their health. Sex Toy Bingo, or STB, is designed to help students fight STIs, sexually transmitted infections. Um, STIs, STDs are a really big problem on college campuses, and so we want to do everything we can to try to just teach people, right? Because if you can teach someone, they can make an educated, informed decision and therefore hopefully live their best life. Among the people in attendance was freshman English student Amanda Ruiz, who was surprised to see all genders attending. I was kind of shocked that they had a lot of toys for guys as well. Organizer Carissa Ruff says, don't think sex toy bingo is only about safe sex. And, and I think it's, some people get kind of cranky because they're like, well, you're promoting sex, therefore people are having sex. And it's like, no, like you're giving them the knowledge and education. It doesn't matter if they're sexually active or not. Or he ate the booty, he ate the booty like groceries. <laughs> it's not exactly your grandmother's bingo game. For Montclair News Lab, I'm Robert O'Connor. Finally, we're going to meet a group of Montclair State students who are all about street feet fashion. Say that three times fast. Victoria Krisnowick takes us to the Willowbrook Mall. Remember when your mother used to yell at you for drawing on your shoes? Well, now it's encouraged at a local van store. The popular shoe brand in Willowbrook Mall recently held an art competition for student artists to design their own shoes. It's called the College Customization Studio. We're trying to get the best artists possible and the best artists who, who can bring their fan following and uh, compete with other artists in a fun-filled competition. Matthew Getz is a film major at Montclair State University and a brand ambassador. We're looking for that off-the-wall uh, kind of character, and off-the-wall is kind of the uh, slogan of Vans, which pretty much means be who you are. Well, I got selected to come here, so I was just excited to to test my skills on a different piece of uh, a different medium. In each round, 10 artists had an hour to design their slip-on canvas shoe. Bystanders can sign up by the door to vote for their favorite design and receive a tote bag and a wooden chip to place into the artist number jar. <laughs> First place winners received a custom code for Vans.com to design their own shoes online for free. Second and third place winners received a Vans sketchbook Every artist who participated could take their own creations home. It was an amazing turnout. Um, we had so many people. This whole store was packed. I'm really hoping, finger crossed, that we do it again because it was honestly such an amazing experience. I met so many great people along the way. This is a chance for brands to connect with their customers in a creative and fun way. I'm Victoria Shinovic from Montclair News Lab. Thank you for joining us on Montclair News Lab. From the School of Communication and Media, I'm Ashley Kuzikonki. And I'm Amanda Eustace. Montclair News Lab will be back next year, but to stay connected, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Montclair News Lab. And follow us on Twitter at MSU News Lab to view the latest newscast and get a behind the scenes look at our productions. Have happy, a happy holiday! holiday.
Oh, my God. 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 O